And here to the rescue is Madam Penguin. <laughs> well, that was unexpected. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, well, I thank you all for being here. I'm uh, incredibly excited to be going even earlier than I thought. Um, but uh, the other day, as I was preparing for this presentation, I heard somebody describe scientists as just a bunch of big kids that never really grew up because we've never lost our sense of curiosity and we just need to know stuff, you know, we just want to know stuff. And believe it or not, that's actually one of the more flattering descriptions of scientists, actually. Um, but I would like to add to that sentiment that in the case of emperor penguins, which you see on the screen here, um, we all kind of become a bunch of big kids, at least if my experiences are any indication, because every time I come back from Antarctica, I get the inevitable, like, oh, did you get to see one? You know, did you get to touch one? Um, and everyone's just incredibly curious about, about emperor penguins. And it's, I think, for a couple of good reasons. Um, the first one is they've kind of had an elevated celebrity status recently. You know, they've been in movies, they're movie stars. So, you know, Happy Feet and the documentary March of the Penguins. Um, but the other reason, I think, is because despite them living in the most desolate, remote, cold, but very beautiful uh, place in the world, we actually kind of know a lot about them. And, um, you know, they're, they're very well studied. But the fun part about science, the fun part about being a biologist and what I do, is that there's always something more to learn. It's fascinating to me about how much we have learned throughout this entire conference, right, and how much we learn in our day-to-day -day lives, but there's always something more to learn. Um, and so what I'm really excited to share with you today is something very new that I have learned. Um, it's brand new research that you guys will actually be the first people in the whole world to hear about. Um, yeah, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and it has to do with kind of a new way to think about emperor penguins. Like I said, we know a lot about them, but this is kind of a, a new take on how we think about them. So the first thing I want to do, though, is kind of set the stage a bit and talk about sea ice, because sea ice is an incredibly important thing for emperor penguins, and it's also important to understand. Um, so emperor penguins are actually the only penguins that never come on land. They're always either foraging in the ocean or they breed on the sea ice, which is exactly how it sounds. It is ice that is on the ocean. So they're never actually on land. And the reason that's important is because sea ice changes all the time. Some years it's really extensive, uh, sometimes it's thick, sometimes it's not. That's from year to year. But even within a year, the sea ice will change as well. So what you're looking at here is the Antarctic continent with the winter sea ice extent around it. And you can see it's very vast. As the weather gets very cold, the sea ice expands. But in the summertime and in the spring, when the, when the water gets a little bit warmer and the air gets warmer, this is what happens. And the sea ice, OK, pretend there's a laser pointer over there. Uh, the sea ice uh, retreats a little bit closer to the continent. Um, and so there's, uh, there, it's just always changing, it's dynamic. And so what that means is that emperor penguins have to deal with that. They have a habitat that is constantly changing. And as you may have heard, uh, some of the sea ice trends in Antarctica are also changing, particularly on the, <laughs> if you can, the, the peninsula area. That area is um, having some pretty rapid um, changes in the sea ice extent. It's kind of going away. So that's sea ice for you. But one of the fun things, interesting things, I think about emperor penguins is that nearly everything we know about them comes from just one colony. Antarctica is huge. Um, as you might imagine, it's pretty difficult to study them. Um, and that star is in the wrong spot. It's not out, they're not out in the ocean like that. So the star is a little bit farther out into the ocean. Thank you, ma'am. Um, they're suppo supposed to be right about here. Anyway, that's the location of the only colony um, that has been studied for a really long time. It's called Point Geology. Um, and that's actually where the movie March of the Penguins was, was filmed. So we know a lot about this colony. And one of the cool things that has come out of, of this research is information on their survival rates. And uh, in order to study survival in animals, you have to have individuals identified. Otherwise, you don't know, you know how many are, are living and dying from time to time. 
Now, emperor penguins, if you've seen March of the Penguins, you realize that they are impossible to differentiate, right? They all look exactly the same. They're not like uh, leopards that have spot patterns or um, whales that'll have, you know, different fluke patterns. These guys look all the same. And so what researchers have to do, and what they had done, is band them. So they'll put a band on the upper part of their flipper, it doesn't hurt them at all, um, with an ID tag, and that allows researchers to understand who comes back every single year. Another interesting thing that happened at Point Geology um, was they went through a bit of a change in the late 1970s. Um, over the course of about five years, the Southern Ocean changed a bit, and it warmed up, and so did the air temperatures. And at the exact same time, the po population at Point Geology declined from 6,000 breeding pairs to 3,000 breeding pairs, and it has never recovered. And so right now, the prevailing knowledge is that whatever was going on in the Southern Ocean had an impact on that colony. And because these birds were marked, we know how many were surviving, and it turns out that actually the number of animals that were surviving from year to year was decreasing. So there was an increase in mortality at this colony during this time. So in other words, what I'm saying is warming temperatures seem to be kind of a, a bad thing for the survival of the species. However, all of that is predicated on one really important assumption, and that is that these birds have a behavior called phylopatry. Now, what phylopatry is, it means that you come back to the same locations every year, that you don't go from place to place. You breed, you go out and forage in the summertime into the winter, and you come back to the same location. And if you don't come back, you're assumed to be dead. So think about it this way, if you show up to your family reunion and your grandma doesn't show up, I'm guessing you don't automatically assume she's dead, right? I mean, <laughs> cross your fingers, right? Or whatever, you know, there's, we all assume, you know, we understand that there's other places she could be, maybe better places that she could be um, at that time, but we don't assume that they're dead, but in emperor penguins, we do. Okay. Okay, the star's off again. <laughs> um, so, but uh, the reason we, we have this assumption is because um, for a really long time, point geology was thought to be isolated. Um, again, so the star, that little orange dot next to the star is point geology. So what you're looking at again is the Antarctic continent with the known colonies as of just a few years ago. And you can see point geology is, is fairly isolated. So basically what this means is that there wasn't any other place that they could go. So if I'm an emperor penguin and I decide that I want to go somewhere else, I probably would die because if you've seen March of the Penguins, uh, you know that they have to huddle together in the wintertime to stay warm. If you decide to leave, you are not going to make it throughout the wintertime. So the point is that there's a, there's a reason for this assumption that they were phylopatric. There was really no other place that they could go. But, as I mentioned, science builds on science, and it's so incredibly fun um, to use a new technology, kind of a new tool, to find something completely unexpected. And that's what's happened uh, just recently. And that is the innovation of the use of high-resolution satellite imagery. The way to describe the, the images, so satellites are, are orbiting the Earth all the time. Um, and, and imagery has been used to study the Earth for a long time as well. But there's a difference between the images that we had previously gotten and the ones that we can get now. So when the photographer was taking our picture yesterday, um, you know, he took it with a camera, and what it would be like the older images, it would be like uh, taking that picture with like a two megapixel camera. If you printed that picture out and blew it up, all of our faces would be pretty blurry. Like, we'd still be there, you could tell that there's a crowd, but you wouldn't be able to see our faces. I'm guessing he took that picture with a very high resolution, you know, camera, probably 18 megapixels or more, and if you blew that up, you would be able to see all of our faces. That's exactly what we're talking about here. It's very high resolution, um, and I can actually use it to understand um, the individual birds. Like, we can actually pick out the individual birds. So I'm going to break down what this image is like. Um, so on this side, we have the Antarctic continent. The reason I point that out is because even though it's white, there's land under there. And the rest of the picture is sea ice and grounded icebergs. And if you can see that brown stain in the middle of the picture, that is an emperor penguin colony because they are the only animals that live on the sea ice 
That's my telltale sign that an emperor penguin colony is there because they poop. And they poop a lot, and I can see it on these satellite images. And so that's how I can tell that there's a colony at any given location. So I can look at all kinds of images, most of them are white, but when I see that, I get really excited. <laughs> Never thought I'd get excited for poop, but I do. Um, so as I was looking at some images about a year ago, I found actually a new colony of emperor penguins, which is that blue star up there, which is incredibly exciting to find something new because I feel like I own it now, like that's my colony. Um, and uh, because I knew where all the other colonies were, I knew that that was, that was a new one. But the interesting thing about it is that is its location. Not only is it on the Antarctic Peninsula, where the sea ice is changing a bit, but it is 190 kilometers to the south of that X, which represents the only colony known to have gone extinct due to the lack of sea ice. So the next question that I had in my mind, because why not, was, well, maybe they didn't go extinct. You know, maybe they didn't die, maybe they just moved. Right? I mean, that seems like the smart thing to do. <laughs> if your habitat's not there anymore, you just move, right? So I couldn't let this idea go. I'm a scientist, I'm curious. I just had, I couldn't let it go. And so I needed to find out if there were other instances uh, that would support this idea. And so I went back through lots of images of the entire coastline again to see um, you know, if, if colonies were you know, moving, basically. So again, this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for that brown stain on the sea ice. And it turns out that in just the course of about four years, just by looking at the images, I found six instances where colonies were blinking in and out. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. So a good example is um, a colony called Letta Bay, which was found in 2002 on some imagery, imagery. When I went to look for it in 2009, it was gone. Like, nowhere near, like up and down the coast, they're nowhere to be found. But in 2010, when I looked again, exact same spot, there they were again. And in every single year since, they have been gone. So if these birds are supposed to be coming back to the same locations, that situation just doesn't make any sense, right? Like they're not coming out of thin air, you know, they're not hiding. Um, you know, where are these birds coming from? And so this suggests that they are potentially moving from place to place. The other thing that I found, though, um, was something a bit, more, a bit more about their biogeography in general. What you're looking at here, again, is the Antarctic continent with the 30 known colonies as of just a few years ago. And again, point geology actually is in the box this time, so that's good. <laughs> um, you can see point geology is, is isolated. But by looking at the high-resolution imagery, my colleagues and I found an additional 24 colonies in Antarctica. And it turns out that point geology is not isolated like we once thought it was. Those two blue dots right next to it are new colonies, or newly discovered colonies, that we found just by looking at the imagery. And so what that suggests to me is that perhaps they did have a new place to go when the things were changing around a bit in the Southern Ocean. Maybe they did have these other locations to go. To keep it in mind, the, those two colonies are only about 200, 250 kilometers away. That's an easy trek for an emperor penguin to make. So because of that, I don't think that emperor penguins are always philopatric. I think that they can be. Um, I think when times get tough, though, I think they have the ability to move. You know, and I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. If you were reliant on something that changes as much as sea ice does, wouldn't you want to evolve to have, you know, the ability to move around and, and change up uh, your habitat if it's no longer there? It really kind of makes sense. So I want to finish up, though, with why that's important. Um, you know, emperor penguins are kind of this thing that's, they're far away, and, and many of us, uh, you know, may never see them other than maybe in pictures or at the zoo. So why should we care? And uh, the, first, the first reason I think this is important is because this challenges, you know, what we think about emperor penguins just in general. Um, it's like, to put it this way, if you want to do uh, an, an algebra problem, you have to know how to do addition and subtraction, right? You need, you need to be able to do that. In order to actually understand emperor penguin population dynamics and how the species is going to change and either adapt or not with the changing climate and even you know, changing prey distributions, we have to know how they're behaving. 
And if they're not behaving, uh, you know, philopatrically, if they don't come back to the same locations, that completely opens up the discussion about what we need to be thinking. If a population's in decline nowadays, I really now think we need to be looking at the populations on either side of it. Maybe they're just moving. If one's declining, maybe the other one's growing. And that's a very, you know, being dead and moving are very different things, right? <laughs> um, so that's really in, in, an important thing to understand, and I think that's one of the things that I want to have come out of this, is that we open up the discussion as scientists again about what it means to be an upper penguin, how we um, have that discussion. But the last thing that is exciting for me as a curious scientist is that this actually opens up more questions than it does answers. Why are they doing this? Is this even normal? I mean, it, it's entirely possible that they just started doing that when I got the satellite imagery, right? I mean, I don't know. Um, so is that normal or is this something that they've always done and we need to think about? The second one is why? You know, why are they doing that? Um, if they are moving around, and maybe they're moving around more frequently, we really need to understand why they're moving. Is it because their habitat's leaving? Or is it because we're fishing in the area and we're taking away their prey? Those two things, among several others, are really important to understand if we want to have an understanding about how we have an impact on these guys, and we do have an impact on these guys. So with that, I think I would just like to finish up and say thank you for, for your attention. Um, Emperor penguins are, are incredibly, uh, incredibly wonderful and uh, a great species to understand, and I think we just, we can always learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Michelle LaRue and the penguins for riding to the rescue. Yeah. That's very nice. <laughs> Thank um, you. Be, be, before you go, uh, I read a little bit uh, about your work and, um, and, and the point you're making is, uh, well, conservationists, environmentalists, and people who, in a way, like to view things with alarm, they will seize on that, right? Uh, but what I read is that as these may develop a problem, other species of penguins are flourishing. Yep. The Adelies, how, how do you pronounce them? Adelie penguins, Adelie yep. penguins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you say a word about that? So, um, the sea ice is very important in Antarctica for more than just habitat. It's also um, where the prey in, so krill and fish, live under the sea ice. So if the sea ice goes away, that's, that's a huge problem for both um, Adelis and emperors. Um, but like the, the penguin species I think you may be referring to are like Gentoo penguins. So they are an open ocean species. They don't need to have the sea ice. And they are doing great along places like the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so as... As the, the problems sea ice is, increase for the one. There are the climate change are winners and losers. There are both. Um, and it's, the idea is that emperor penguins may be one of the losers, but I think it's something that we need to investigate. They may be able to perhaps adapt uh, a little bit longer than we originally thought. That's splendid. Thank you. Thank you. Have you done the shot? Yeah. Great.